All right, we'll, we'll take it from there. All right, so we're going to talk about Windows PowerShell as a service today. Managing clouds, Windows, Linux, on-premise, uh, or public by using Microsoft Operations Management Suite, or OMS for short. I am Ed Wilson, and I'm sometimes referred to as the Microsoft scri uh, Scripting Guy. I uh, also write a blog called Hey Scripting Guy that's read by quite a few people. And I've started as of January uh, the OMS Team Blog, and uh, I'll show you a link to that at the, uh, at the end. If you, you haven't been reading that, that is the absolute place to go to find out everything about OMS. And um, I am up here uh, with my friend from uh, the OMS team, uh, Eamon O'Brien. Hey everyone, my name is Eamon O'Brien. Thanks, Ed. I work on the automation as a service inside of Operations Management Suite. And so we'll kind of walk you through what that looks like today, mostly uh, focused on the PowerShell capabilities. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? We need to have some objections. Uh, not objections, objectives, perhaps. <laughs> okay, so our session objectives and our takeaways. Um, we're going to talk about, you know, why you want to bring, you know, what is PowerShell automation into the cloud. And uh, we're going to talk about what the core capabilities are uh, that our automation services provide. Uh, we'll show you a nice slide about that. You know, it is operations management suite, and the idea there should think of, well, hmm, it's a suite of products, and it really is. And uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that and how all that works. We're also going to, you know, everybody in this room is probably familiar with the very famous PowerShell manifesto. Um, I was actually talking with a, a couple people from the PowerShell team, uh, you know, right before I came in here. And uh, PowerShell has been around for 10 years. It's amazing, you know, so uh, it's really, you know, kind of trips, uh, trips me out a little bit is when I, uh, I'm reading some blog, you know, from somebody, you know, oh, well, we're using this new thing called PowerShell. It's like, dude. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah, so 10 years, it's been around. Well, one of the things that's really cool, you know, and uh, Jeffrey Snover actually republished the uh, PowerShell manifesto, I think, last year, just kind of as a retrospective. But one of the things that, um, that he laid out in that manifesto yeah, is that we honor your investment in PowerShell. And um, they've continued to do that. You know, so that, you know, that stuff that you wrote back in Windows PowerShell 1.0, it still works today. You know, there may very well be some better ways of doing it, <laughs> you know, but it's gonna still, it still works today. You know, it's an amazing level of backward compatibility back over 10 years. You know, but when, when we say, you know, but not only, we're talking about uh, that you can leverage or that we respect your investment in the code, you know, because to be honest, like, oh man, I don't want to look at some of that code I wrote 10 years ago. <laughs> it's embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's certainly, you know, I mean, you know, we always learn, you know, and I've written more than 5,000 PowerShell scripts. Um, and, you know, so, you know, stuff I wrote even last week, you know, I, I think of new ways of writing stuff, writing it better today. But so what am I talking about, you know, leveraging that investment? You know, so when we came out with, you know, your functions, and then we came out with workflows, you know, we respected, you know, what you had learned, you know, from writing functions, you know, in writing workflows. You know, then when we came out with, uh, with DSC, we respected what you had learned, you know, from, you know, working with, you know, workflows, you know, and from functions, you know, and modules, and all of that stuff kind of respects each other. Well, with, with automation, with moving PowerShell into the cloud, you know, we still respect, you know, that and, you know, allow you to leverage, you know, what you've worked on, uh, done. So as a very, very simple example, you know, all that time you spent learning workflows, you know, when we were introduced it, you know, a couple of years ago, dude, it applies. And matter of fact, I'd say, dude, it applies big time. Yeah, so you did not waste your effort learning workflows. But anyway, I'm sorry, we're still doing objectives and takeaways. Uh, so uh, integrating automation, uh, OMS, Observe, you know, on-premises environment. So we're going to talk about, you know, how we tie all this stuff together. We're going to talk about how we solve some very, very real problems. You know, some of the problems that as a person that's been scripting for more than 25 years, questions that I've heard over and over and over again for the last 25 years, you know, we finally solved them. You know, so we've got some very, very real solutions, you know, to some of the problems. And so we're going to talk about that. The key takeaway, you know, we are deeply invested in PowerShell and DSC, you know, and all of that effort that you have spent in learning this technology, we're going to allow you to apply it. Um, 
And as we all know, PowerShell automation, you know, we're heavily uh, dependent upon the community. You know, that's why, you know, we're here. That's why we can have, you know, great pe people like Eamon, you know, take time, you know, on the OMS team, you know, we ship about every three weeks. <laughs> you know, so he's in the middle of a release cycle. <laughs> but <laughs> there's always one now. He's, he's always there. in the middle of a release cycle. Uh, but you know, so he's here, you know, to talk to you. Definitely, we want to we want to talk to you, find out. You know, you know, I think that we've hit a home run with this stuff. You know, or or at least a, you know, a good a good double. You know, uh, but uh, a stand up double. But um, yeah, let us know. Yeah, you know, we're we're here. For, uh, we want to hear your feedback. Okay, I'll take uh, this slide. So, one thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about is, you know, why we went down this path of bringing kind of PowerShell into the cloud, and you know, what were the reasons we thought about as we went down this path. And I think the first one was, you know, we've seen a lot of customers. You know, probably a lot of you are starting to look at adopting cloud technologies. And you know, it might be that most of your stuff is on-premises today, but you're also trying to say, how do I take advantage as I move some of my services and applications to the cloud? How can I also think about moving my management? And so there's kind of core you know, capabilities that the cloud gives you. And one of those is you, know, you need to be able to integrate into all these different clouds now, because you're not going to get rid of all your on-premises stuff as you start to bring things into Azure or into AWS or even into your own uh, service provider. So you want to be able to like talk to all those systems and still integrate them today, just like you might do on premises. Um, the other thing that's been going around for a long time in the automation space is, you know, how do you deliver self-service? You know, most of us are involved in writing PowerShell so that we can kind of complete some process, either a small process on our own server or large processes that go across the entire organization. And when you think about that, one of the main goals we have around that is so that we can offer out that automation to our end users so that they can actually accomplish their tasks when they need it. And so as you think about the cloud, it just drives the self-service capabilities. That's really what cloud is about is I want on-demand virtual machines, I want on-demand storage, SQL. It's really about that self-service capabilities and how do we deliver self-service around PowerShell as well as we go forward. And then the last thing that, you know, I think if you look at the conference and where everyone's focused right now is a lot on DevOps. How do we really enable the kind of continuous deployment of our services and applications working with the development teams, with the operations team, and allow that to go you know, seamlessly back and forth as continuous development happens. You know, a lot of people call this like infrastructure as code or some you know, other name around it, but the idea is how do we have the common tooling so that our development teams and our operations teams can actually talk the same language, use the same tools, and gain the benefits of kind of that end-to-end -end development and management. And then the other trend I talked a little bit about is as people start to think about, okay, I want to take advantage of the cloud because I gain all the benefits of scale out there, I don't have to worry about the infrastructure, you know, how does management also play into that? You know, why would you want to move your management to the cloud? And it's really the same reasons you might want to move anything to the cloud, is you don't really want to have to manage the infrastructure anymore. You want to take advantage of the capabilities the cloud gives you and focus more on those scripts you're writing, on the processes you're trying to do, and not managing the infrastructure. Um, the other big trend we've seen, and I don't know if you guys are seeing it as well, is that you know, the world is getting more and more heterogeneous. And when you think about heterogeneous, it's mostly around, you know, we live in a lot of a window space, but most of the customers we talk with, and probably a lot of you, have other systems in your environment. You probably have Linux in, in your environment, but for sure you have other management solutions. You're probably not running all the management stack. And so how do you talk to all those systems as they start to grow and grow, and as you move to the cloud, they just grow more and more? And so we really want to think about how do we go about solving that communication, that integration across Windows, Linux, as well as all the different systems you have to talk to to complete that process. And then the last one is, you know, I think everyone here is committed that, you know, kind of automation and PowerShell is the way to actually automate your end-to-end -end processes, but it also starts to put a lot more pressure on the systems because now we're seeing automation at scale. You know, whereas before we might do some automation to complete some tasks, we now see it as a pillar for most organizations as they start to develop more and more integrated management solutions across the environment. And so we wanted to build something that says, okay, we can actually solve that problem and give you automation at scale. So it can go from your small needs all the way up to the largest needs you might ever need because we're able to bring it from the cloud. So that's kind of one of the, a lot of the reasons why we actually started our thinking about, okay, all the PowerShell stuff that works today, how can we actually bring that to the cloud, solve a lot of the problems that you're seeing today, but also set you up for success in the future as you start to think about moving more and more um, assets towards the cloud. Hey, do you want to talk about uh, operations management suite? Absolutely. 
So uh, this is this is showing you know uh, Microsoft's IT manage, uh, management solution. Now, if you look down here at the bottom, you know we got System Center. Yeah, and so you know System Center has been around. It's very mature technology, um, and you know, primarily you know it's been used and focused you know for managing the on-premises servers. You know all those servers that are over there, System Center talks to it and it helps to manage. And then a few years ago, Microsoft started getting into the cloud. And so, you know, we've got Azure, you know, up there. And initially, you know, the idea was, you know, hey, we need to be able to provide the same kind of management capabilities for the cloud, you know, that we've been able to have, you know, for our on-premises servers. You know, as we try to shift more of the load to the cloud, you know, the need to manage it, you know, grows proportionally as well. And so that's kind of where, you know, operations management suite, you know, the idea, you know, for it came from, you know, is that, you know, we need to be able to manage this up there on the top. But we're not in a total cloud world. We're not a total on-prem world, you know. It's a, uh, it's a hybrid world, you know. And so the need really needs, uh, is there, you know, for hybrid management. You know, we need to be able to, to manage both. And by the way, in case you don't know, Azure isn't the only cloud service. You know, there's also this little thing that's called AWS or something that some people use, you know. Um, and so, you know, we need to be able to manage that too. You know, and not only that, you know, as, you know, a lot of times, you know, people have their stuff in both places. You know, they got Azure, they got, uh, they got AWS. So there are four pillars, you know, for Microsoft Operations Management Suite. You know, as is a suite, so you can think of it you know, as so four things. As we were putting the product together, you know, we drew from different resources and we brought stuff together. So uh, a lot of people who have heard about OMS, they think, you know, it's all about log, log analytics. You know, um, you know um, analytics, you know, mon monitoring, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah, and that, that is a piece, you know, but, uh, or people sometimes think, yeah, well, it's, a, you know, it's automation. Yeah, you know, and, and there is a configuration and automation you know, piece as well. On Monday, we talked about using you know, the OMS you know, automation you know, DSC you know, to solve a number of very real problems you know, that we have with desired state configuration. You know, one of the simple ones you know, the, to highlight out of that is you know, setting up a pool server. You know, setting up a pool server is kind of a pain. You know, setting up a pool server correctly is almost a shot in the dark. Yeah, well, we give that to you for free, you know, as soon as, as, soon as you start doing LMS you know, and automation, you've got that. You know, there's a backup and disaster recovery component. You know, there is also a security and compliance component. You know, some of the stuff that we have, we provide deep insights, you know, into your environment, you know, that allow you to pull this information out, you know, and expose stuff, you know, that you might not have even known was there. Um, and so all of this, you know, so, op um, so uh, OMS, you know, sits right there, you know, in the middle, you know, where we're doing the cloud, we're also doing the on-prem, you know, and because of that, you know, um, as we're initially, you know, looking, you know, a lot of our customers are, are looking at stuff, you know, we got System Center, you know, and OMS, and they actually wind up being better together. Uh, but OMS is not a cloud-only solution. You know, we can do cloud, we can also do, you know, the on-prem, we can do Linux, you know, we can do the other things. You know, it's not necessarily a lay on top of System Center. You can have OMS by itself or you can have System Center, you know, with OMS on top. You know, so it is pretty much, you know, the kind of management that you need for your environment, you know, that allows you to take care of these capabilities. Great. Yeah, so I think the area we're focused on today, obviously, is the configuration automation. It's most tied with all the PowerShell capabilities around all your scripts, but also your DSC. Um, but the last slide, before we kind of give you an overview of what's going on, is you know I think everybody starts to realize when they look at the kind of life cycle of the infrastructure and the application that there's a bunch of capabilities required when you're actually managing not just the infrastructure and the application, and it goes all the way up from you know how do you do the build to how do you configure that, and all the way through the monitoring, you know, backup and recovery, how do you make sure it's secure, the governance, all of that is really required as you start to think about, especially in the enterprise world. What does it mean to manage the infrastructure and the application? And it's been a real challenge. You know, I think we've had a lot of good tooling in System Center to actually help with that with PowerShell and all the other management tools. But as you start to expand that to the cloud, how do you still have the same processes as your stuff moves to the cloud? And I think at the core of this, a lot of core services you know, will offer their own kind of built-in automation. Like when you do backup, it backs it up for you. And you can say, that's automation because it backed it up for me. But you know, a lot of times, you really need to connect systems together to really provide a solution. 
And that's where the configuration and automation service can kind of be used as a core throughout your entire life cycle, not just the infrastructure and the application, to make sure that the end-to-end -end works. And at the core of that is the PowerShell because of its ability to kind of connect into everything and deliver that service. And so you'll see, you know, as you start thinking about the whole life cycle, how automation configuration is actually central to all of that. Obviously, when you're doing the configuration side and other things, we have like built-in capabilities itself, like DSC, that is required for that. But when you think about the whole life cycle, I would also say, you know, at the root of it all is configuration and automation. Okay, so let me jump into a demo. So we got to kind of the core, you know, slides. But how many people have actually seen the automation service? Good, we've seen two or three. So I'm going to jump in just to spend uh, five minutes trying to level set everybody what it's about. And then uh, hopefully as we go forward, you'll kind of get an idea of, you know, why we built it out and how you can start taking advantage of it yourself. So if you go into the um, portal up in Azure, there's actually uh, called automation accounts over here. So you can go and create a brand new automation account. I think um, we showed that um, on Monday with Joe. Um, so I just created one and I might you know, jump into you know, some of the capabilities around that. But when you first create an automation account, here's what you're gonna see. So you'll see this basically the homepage. And this is kind of your overview of what's going on inside the service. And it has a set of things. So what we call runbooks are basically PowerShell scripts, PowerShell workflows, or graphical um, runbooks. So we kind of have three types of language we support today. We may add more in the future. But all of those are runbooks to us because they basically allow you to deliver a process. Um, from our assets perspective, I'll jump in here because it's kind of a set underneath here. And this is really where we try to solve a lot of the problems that PowerShell has today. Um, and you know, some of them is, the first thing is we allow scheduling. So you, know, you don't have to kind of set up your own scheduler using task scheduler or something else and manage that. We do all of that from the cloud. So if you have things you want to run on schedule, it's available from the service. The other thing is all of your modules. So as some of you know, when you're trying to like automate and do PowerShell, you kind of have to make sure the modules are on the right system when they're actually going to get deployed and actually executed. And so what we do with our modules is you can centralize them all into our service and then we can distribute those out to wherever you need them. They can run from in our service, but you'll see that we're starting to bring it so that you saw with the DSC probably on Monday. We download all the modules needed for that configuration so that you can actually run it. And so you don't have to worry about the distribution of all of your modules going forward because you can centrally manage them here. From a certificate thing, it all really depends on what you do with certificates, but a lot of times certificates themselves need to get deployed and managed. And so we allow you to do that. It might be something as simple as you know, setting up a like certificate auth um, between servers, or it might be deploying a certificate to actually um, use for authentication and security over an IAS. So it really depends, we allow all of that inside of our service as well. Um, the connections I'll talk a little bit about later, but these are really um, an object that allows you to kind of separate what system you're talking to into a connection object so that you can reuse that inside your PowerShell going forward and you don't have to hard code that into the system. Obviously, uh, variables are kind of the catch-all. So Again, all of this is trying to allow you to say, I don't have to put stuff into the scripts. I can put stuff into a central location of service, and then I can reuse those across all of my PowerShell as I go forward. And it's the kind of the goal of like, you know, we've seen it for years, and most of you probably do it, but don't hard code anything into the PowerShell, because then it doesn't really become reusable. And so if we can allow you to pull all of that domain knowledge into a central store, and then you just use it at runtime, it really allows you to have a powerful, flexible, and shareable PowerShell scripts. You know, the most obvious one of that is like your credentials. You probably use credentials to connect to a bunch of different systems. But when the password changes, you don't want to figure out to have to go back to the scripts or some other place. You can just set it once here, and then all of the PowerShell you've written just inherits that as it goes forward. Uh, and then uh, I mentioned variables, and here's our credential stores. So I won't go into DSC configurations because I think you guys have uh, saw this on Monday, but obviously we have full management of all configurations inside our service. So you can upload your configurations, you can compile them into the MOFs, you can deploy them out to any server, either in Azure, on-premises, in AWS, and it's a pull service. So they get all their configuration and all the reporting comes back through our service. Um, jobs, again, is you know, how do you troubleshoot? You know, one of the challenges when you run scripts on-premises today is you know, how do you know what happened if something goes wrong? Like, where's all your logs being stored? You're writing them to some share, or you're trying to put them in some folder. We'll centralize every single action that's taken from the automation into our jobs. So if you need to go back and troubleshoot, you get the full log of what happened, but you also get which PowerShell script was used at the time. So you can actually say, well, did someone change my PowerShell script and that's why it's failing? 
or is it because the script just started to fail now and what was the error? All of that is centrally managed inside the service, so you never have to worry about that going forward. Uh, these are the nodes on management. Um, again, I think you saw most of these on Monday. And here's the node configurations that were actually uh, available. Question. Question, yes. Hey, if, uh, if I'm doing DSC full server on here and it's uh, contacting my nodes local on premise, yep. Am I going to be able to tell from here what's going on? Yeah, so there's full reporting. I won't, uh, so you can, like, one of these. Like with my local nodes, what's happening? Yeah, you'll know exactly what's going on on prem inside of the OS. All of the reporting shows up here. So because it's a pull service, you'll see that, you know, I'll just jump in here to one that's compliant because this one's running. But you'll see I have a configuration that basically installs some Windows features, sets up a website. I um, copy some stuff from Azure Storage. I do some file work. I get some stuff from a remote file, and I install a package. You know, standard stuff you'd see in DSC. But now, all of this is reporting back. So if one of these things fail, like, you know, you couldn't set the website up correctly, I can drill in and you'll see exactly what's going on. So you can see here, I took action against the default website as well as I created a new website inside my configuration. So you can basically do troubleshooting all the way from the top level down to the actual resource that might be failing inside DSC. So yeah, that's not, uh, you know, that's one of the major advantages you'll get is kind of the central management of everything. Okay, I'm gonna jump out of here because I know we um, have other stuff to show. Uh, but the last thing to show here, obviously you get the overview of your jobs, plus we have source control integration directly into GitHub if you're starting to go down that path. Um, you can just pull all of your scripts directly from there and it allows for kind of that source control. Okay. Can you connect it to a different Git repository? So today it's only um, GitHub that we directly integrate with. I have some sample PowerShell out there that allows you to basically connect to local Git, to TFS online, and you can basically use any kind of source control you want, and it basically just runs. Um, and I can share that later if you like. Yeah, I think on the online system, TFS is already showing up with uh, coming soon or something like that. I know, it's coming. I would soon is the... <laughs> uh, <laughs> the key word there. Um, it is coming, but uh, we don't have a date on it yet. But there are some ways to do it today. I actually have a, uh, a little uh, script that just runs and does that automatically. There's lots of ways to do it, especially with our webhooks. Um, but yeah, we're going to try to make the yeah, integration. Yeah, so that's to integrate your script into there, and then it's ready to go. Right? Yeah, no, um, that's I've good. One, I have one question: Is our um, uh, certificates showing up here? Is there a way to store those certificates in, uh, in Azure Key Vault, or where are they stored? So today we store them, and it's kind of a similar type of thing to Key Vault, but we have our own store, a secure store in the back end that we use, and then um, we pull them out as you need at runtime. Um, you could use uh, Key Vault commandlets if you want to store them there, and then at runtime pull them in to your script if you didn't want us to store them. But it's a very similar back end security model we have um, to Key Vault. Cool. There's another question back here. Yep. Um, so uh, to, uh, to accomplish the build integrations and then the version controlling system, so essentially we may have to punch holes to firewall from in-house and to the Azure endpoint. No, you won't. Uh, so the question was, you know, if you wanted to sync with your local Git or your local, you know, source TF TFS, you know, does that mean we have to open up a bunch of ports so that we can connect to it to pull all those, um, you know, committed uh, run books and scripts? And you don't. And the one way you don't have to do it is. I kind of showed it, but I didn't talk about it, was we have a hybrid worker in our service. And so what the hybrid worker does, you can deploy this into your own uh, environment on-premises, and then it reaches out for work. So it's only outbound ports that it has to go. So there's no holes being punched into your firewall, it's just outbound port you have to open. And then that's how you can actually sync everything up and then send it up um, through there. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, Okay, so let me just kind of, re I know I flew by a little bit on that, but I just want to level set everyone. Hopefully you got a view for what we offer. But it really comes down to these major areas. I won't go through each one. But obviously everything is through the browser, so you can access it anywhere. So all of the user experience, all the authoring you can do up there in the browser as well. Um, I might show that later. We have full uh, role-based access control. So if you want to say only certain parts of your organization have access to certain automation accounts, you can actually assign an operator role and they can just execute stuff in there. They can't actually modify, look at any of the credentials, do any of that. Um, similarly, you saw some of the source control versioning work that we've done. From the authoring, we have two ways, you know, this is the PowerShell Summit, but we also offer graphical authoring uh, if you want to use that. And you can use graphical authoring with PowerShell and vice versa. Um, but obviously we have an authoring experience for PowerShell directly in the browser as well. 
So if you wanted to author in there and you're on the road and you need to fix something up, you can directly do it inside the browser and test it and then deploy it. Um, I didn't jump on the gallery, I think we may show that later, but we have a gallery experience that we can integrate with. So this allows you to pull all your modules from PowerShell Gallery. Everything is going to PowerShell Gallery. So if stuff isn't up there that you need, either please write it yourself and upload it or ask us and we'll try to upload it as well. But everything we're doing is building upon PowerShell Gallery as the kind of the source and the community content that's up there. Um, so we don't want to create another one because there's such a huge ecosystem around it already. And he says, he says modules on the PowerShell Gallery, but we also have scripts up on the PowerShell Gallery as well. And so if you, so if you just written kind of a quick script or a workflow or something like that, you'll be able to pull that down from the gallery as well. Yeah, I just got added the, the script uh, yeah. read to it recently. So it's another way, and we're going to kind of do first class integration with that um, very soon. I won't go through the Runbook engine, you can probably imagine, but everything is built. So we run all of this securely and isolated in the back end for you. So we basically create you know, a host that you can run all of your PowerShell in the service. And it can scale as many as you want. It's resilient, it can fail over, you can specify which regions, all of that kind of capability. You just get for free by moving things to the service. And it has a, because it's a service, you can integrate it very easily. I'll show you some of the ways you can extend and integrate into the service because it has REST APIs that you can integrate with as well as obviously all the commandlets through the Azure commandlets that you can manage it. Uh, the integration I talked a little bit about, so I won't spend any time on that, but you know, I mentioned earlier that you know, the key value prop really of PowerShell is not just a great language, but it's because everybody and a lot of our partners and competitors have really onboarded with PowerShell as a way to manage systems. And not just Windows systems, but actually management systems and even clouds. I don't know if any of you guys have tried the AWS uh, module that's out there, but it's like, it's pretty awesome. They have like, I think 700 different commandlets for managing every single thing you could do against AWS. And all of that can be run inside of our service. So it really kind of shows the power of, you know, using PowerShell, but the ecosystem around it, it really does allow that integration to take place. Cool. Um, okay, so I'm gonna hand over to Ed and he'll uh, talk a little bit about you know, if you want to, how do you bring it over? Okay, so I, I, so I started off by talking about you know how we honor your your investment in PowerShell. Well, then that that makes it so well. Okay, well, dude, you know. Um, so obviously the language, you know, by being able to use the PowerShell language and stuff, you know, but you've also got scripts that you've already written, and a lot of those scripts you can bring directly into this uh, to uh, to our service to be able to run immediately. Um, some of them you're going to want to change a little bit, so. How many of you ever remember, you know, that Don Jones said, you know, don't use right host, that every time you use right host, you kill a kitten, right? Okay. Well, not only that, it's going to kill <laughs> your automation script. Okay. Yeah. You may not like kittens. You know, I actually saw a picture of a dog, you know, sitting there typing right host, right host, right host. <laughs> but um, so use right output. It's simple. You know, write a PowerShell script that goes through every single one of your PowerShell scripts and changes write host to write output. Actually, hmm, that might be a good scripting guy article. Yeah. Be easy to do. Yeah, uh, and you're, you're already set. Now, the nice thing about write output is not so much from, you know, when you're actually doing your automation because as Eamon said, you know, we have great logging. You know, but when you're testing, you know, when you're, uh, when you're, uh, when you're testing your, your automation to make sure that it wants to work, yeah, it's nice if you have something that kind of comes out. You know, it, this is kind of like using, you know, uh, you know, set debug preference or something like that, you know, where you use the right debug, you know, but we just use right output, you know, and I don't know what would happen if I used right debug. It may work, it might not. I, I just figured no, I wouldn't. We suggest right verbose. Yeah, uh, right verbose. Okay, so, uh, so that would be better. But, you know, or... Right output, you know, just to, to throw you some little status points up, you know, as you're writing this stuff, you know, for the very first time. Yeah, so, and, um, no, and no read host. And yeah, absolutely. Don't read host. <laughs> Obviously, that's not going to work, you know. Um, don't use get credential. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, all, all, a lot of stuff like that. I've actually got an article that's kind of in the works right now uh, that I'm going to have on the OMS team blog, you know, where, I talk, uh, where I'm going to go into some more, much more detail, you know, about the stuff that you want to clean out of your, your PowerShell scripts, you know, before you, uh, you stuff them uh, into automation. You know, you, uh, another thing you want to do is you're going to want to modularize. That's actually a word I made up back for uh, my Step-by-Step uh, Step 2.0 book. You know, uh, where you, you take your scripts, you know, and you can kind of put, break them into component pieces. 
Okay, so you want to do that, you know, because if you break your scripts up into component pieces, you know, rather than having these great big old monolithic, you know, I call them Franken scripts, you know, break it up into small discrete pieces. That way you can reuse them. You know, so for instance, if you've got a, got a script, you know, that sends, you know, that calls SMTP mail, you know, because you want to, you know, call, uh, send out an email or something. Yeah, that makes a nice little piece. You know, you can just kind of store it up there and you can just simply call it, bring it in, you know, wherever you want to. Although we've got some stuff that's coming, you know, that you're not going to want to do that. You know, because when you, we're building in the email notification, you know, features. You know, so, um, so you'll, you'll want to be able to try to take advantage of that as well. Uh, we have, um, we've got a scheduler that's really cool. And uh, so uh, you can create multiple schedules. You know, and then just attach that schedule, you know, to your script however you want. It's going to just run. You're going to get all the notification. Anybody that's ever tried to uh, use, you know, even the, the PowerShell scheduler or the at command, you know, or the, uh, the Windows, uh, you know, Vista scheduler, you know, we've got like three or four different schedule engines, you know, in, built into Windows, none of which is perfect. You know, each of which has major problems and issues around reporting, you know, credentials and all of that stuff. And then you... When you start trying to test these things, it takes forever because you have to schedule it to run, you know, to test it, and you don't know if it was a credential issue, an access issue, you know, a resource issue, you know, or what that caused, or just <laughs> I forgot to close a curly brace. <laughs> you, know, you know, you don't know what caused that script to fail. Well, with our uh, with our you know resources and logging and stuff, you're going to be able to figure that out. Um, workflow. Workflow is the way to go. Uh, way to go around here, and I'm, I'm going to show you uh, show you that in a little bit. Now, this last thing here, auto, auto, uh, authoring in the ISE. Yeah, I use the PowerShell ISE all the time. Yeah, I love the fact that it's expandable and we can do the add-ons and stuff. I love the fact that we've got it up on GitHub now, PowerShell Gallery. You can download new versions of it. Yeah, uh, all that stuff. Um, Joe Levy uh, wrote an ISE add-on. Matter of fact, that's going to be in tomorrow's. Uh, OMS um, blog. Uh, I'm going to talk about that. Uh, so he brought an ISE add-on, you know, that connects automatically to automation. You know, allows you to pull in your run books. You know, you can you've got IntelliSense right there in the ISE. You, it creates a local store right in your profile. You know, we use JSON to keep it in sync. You know, with the uh, you know with the uh, run books and stuff that's available uh, in your automation, um, and um, you can test it right there. That's why I say so. Uh, so I can edit. You know, I can save a draft to the cloud. Yeah, I can publish it to the cloud. Yeah, I can test it from the cloud. I can run it local. You know, however I want. It is a very, very, very cool thing. Yeah, and it's only on version point two. Yeah, can you imagine what it's going to be like when it finally gets to version one? <laughs> uh, it is open source, by the way. Uh, it's on. Um, it, it, it is published in the PowerShell gallery, which of course also means that it's back in GitHub. And so if you want to contribute, if you want to fork it, you know, and, and add some stuff to it you know, yourself, you're more than welcome to do that. Yep, I can show later on to uh, I'll show you a link to us if you want to uh, start contributing. Okay, so uh, let me show you this. So uh, bringing your investments into the uh, automation service. So um, now I'm going to tell you a story. So uh, Sunday night, you know, we were... We were there at the hotel. The scripting life is like downstairs, you know, talking to, you know, I don't know, 20 or 40 <laughs> different people that were like hanging around the bar area down there. Yeah, and um, I went up and I was having like some issues. So I sent Teresa an email and you know, I said, hey, I need you to, uh, to come up to the room. I need you to, uh, to help me with my demo. And she goes, huh? <laughs> yeah, and I said, yeah. Um, so why do I need her to help me with her demo? Well, because she is an MVP, you know, which means that she has a free Azure subscription. So I wanted her to activate her Azure subscription. Uh, I wanted her to uh, set up an automation account and, um, and all of that. So she did it and I didn't help her because I was like busy working on something else. You know, and she did all of this and then, you know, of course, and then she made the mistake after she put her credit card in and made the mistake of giving me her credentials. So, <laughs> so, I, so, woo so I'm logged up. So uh, that's why this actually, uh, this is the, it is the scripting watch portal, you know, and uh, Teresa is the automation account name. Now, one of the things that's really, really cool, and we just, uh, just introduced <laughs> this recently. And uh, so, uh, and I've got, I'm going to be writing some OMS team blog articles about this. 
So it, if you go back and you're looking at Azure Automation and some of the scripts and trying to automate some stuff, you know, you'll see that there's a lot of stuff out there. A lot of the stuff is kind of difficult to work. I mean, because you know it's using Azure commands, it's using Azure RM commandlets. You know, there's talks uh, different. You know, talks about you know trying to um, get access to your particular subscription and all of this stuff. You know, and all of that is pretty much a nightmare, especially if you're just trying to learn this stuff. So, uh, so what we did is we created a, a run as account. And Teresa did this automatically. I didn't even tell her to do this because the GUI, you know, when you're setting stuff up, it's smart enough to say, hey, do you want to create a run as account? She said, yeah. Well, once you create the run as account, then it does three things for you. It creates a run as certificate. Um, it takes your account that you used and actually creates a, an account for that. It also saves your credentials as a credential object and it makes a connection to your default, uh, your default subscription. All of these things were issues before. Okay? Yeah, um, it definitely solves a lot of that. I think if you tried this out, it depends on your organization. You know, a lot of times you can't really use your user account because you might have two-factor auth enabled, which won't work inside the service. Whereas now we've basically taken advantage of service principles inside of Azure AD, and that's what we create behind the scenes for you. And then we do search auth against those so you can manage your certs and then we add you as a contributor to the subscription but you could go in and manage and change that and do anything you want but just does all of this by default just by checking the box during creation right now okay so uh this is um this is a little bit of code that uh, that Tracy did yeah and um pretty uh so once you once you've done that then you use get off uh get automation connection and it's, uh, the name is the Azure Run As Connection. Now then you add, uh, add your Azure RM account, specify your service principal, you got a tenant, the tenant ID, the application ID, blah, blah, blah. Now, I say she wrote it. She wrote this probably the way that lots of you write code. <laughs> she found it, cut and pasted it, right? <laughs> so what, the other thing that's really cool is that once you set up this Run As account, it automatically does a, a, a demo test script um, There's a tutorial, yeah. yep. Uh, to the tutorial, and that's where this code came from. Okay, but now you just simply paste this into uh, into all of your other stuff. Yeah, and um, you can see how easy it is to come over here. So there's the code. You kind of cleaned it up a little bit. You know, but uh, to add your RM account, blah, 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 you know, and um, that's all you really need. And then at that point, your, uh, your scripts, you add this in, and then your scripts will just simply work. Um, so let's go back over here. And uh, I want to show you two, um, two run books. And uh, these run books are, are using uh, this uh, service principle. And uh, this one here. So this is it. It's a workflow. Okay. Uh, workflow start VMs. Now the one thing is your name of your workflow and uh, the name of your run book, those names need to match. Okay, you get an error message, it'll be very obvious if they, if they don't work. Yeah, so there's that code right there that Trisha wrote, you know, to uh, make my connection. And then the rest of it, this is standard PowerShell. You know, basically it's three lines of code, seven, eight, and nine. You know, um, my VMs get the Azure RM VMs. Now these are your newer, uh, Azure, <laughs> your new Azure VMs, not the not the classic mode ones. Okay, if you're creating new uh, new VMs in Azure, you want to be using the new ones, not the classic ones. The classic ones are stuff you created a long time ago. Um, so we get all of those stored in a variable. I just simply use for each. You know, walk through the loop. You know, VM, uh, and then start Azure RM VM. That's a tongue twister. Um, and then give the name of the resource group. Okay. So uh, Teresa created all of her resource group, uh, servers, you know, in a resource group called server. Makes sense, it's servers. <laughs> so this starts them up. And then uh, the, uh, the one that goes exactly with this um, is called stop VMs, basically. Uh, it helps if, uh, I could tell you this, it helps if you create within your company a naming convention. And kind of stick to it. Yeah. You see, this is a stupid name. Because you know? <laughs> I was wanting to figure out how to stop them. 
you know, before I, you know, I, because they were already running, you know. And as they're running, you know, they're tick, 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 you know, just taking money out of your credit card, you know. So, um, so I wanted to figure out how to stop them really quick, and I didn't want to do a bunch of clicky, clicky things, you know, because I'm a power show dude, right? So workflow, stop all of these. Now then, obviously, if I have more than a few, you know, I'd be using for each parallel, you know, because this is a workflow. Okay, but I didn't want to get you know things too complicated here. If you know workflows, obviously you want to know that you, one of the advantages is doing the stuff in parallel. You know, um, same code, exact same code, cut and paste, but instead of start a zero RMVM, it was stop a zero RMVM. So there's your two, uh, there's your two run books. Schedule them. This will help you when you start oh, when you're playing with this stuff. You know, doing your development and everything else. It's, these two are going to save you some money. Guarantee. Yeah, start them up, shut them down. Now, not only that, let me show you this, because uh, you know, I, I really and truly you know, mean it when I say I really don't like mices. Okay? So look what I did. Stop. So this is the schedule. You know, I stopped these at um, okay, so this is uh, this is stop uh, stop on April the seventh. I'm gonna stop these at um, Runs at 7 a.m., is that what it says? Yeah. Uh, different time zone. Okay. Different time zone. Okay. Uh, so, so we're going to start these things you know, at one time. We're going to stop them at another time. Okay. And so they start up. I work. They shut down. That's it. Cool. Uh, I know we're out of time, so I'm going to jump uh, just into the last couple of slides. Uh, one of the things that obviously there's real power in the service itself and that's where you can do all of your automation, all your PowerShell, all your configuration inside the service, but you'll start to see we've actually integrated into a lot of the other OMS services as well. And so as you're starting to do that monitoring, all that log analytics, you can actually now trigger your automation so that you know, if this action happens with your monitoring, you know, maybe you want to escalate into a service desk or maybe you want to restart the VM or all depending on that process, you can now tie, you know, tie the insights with the action together inside the services. Similarly with site recovery, you can do pre-automation um, scripts to run some post-automation scripts to make sure that failover actually happens and that's you know, first class integrated into the service. And then there's a bunch of integration into Azure as well. So if you create an Azure alert today, you can actually say when this alert fires, I want to call a webhook. Uh, we didn't go into the webhooks, but we have webhooks available on our service as well. That basically allows you to call them. But then if you do anything on Azure VMs, we have rich integration where it says run this runbook. It's not just a webhook. So we've kind of first class that experience as well. Um, I don't think we have time for the demo. Um, so I think I'll just jump over it and just finish um, you know, on the slides so that we can answer some questions as well. But the one thing obviously I mentioned earlier is because we're a service, it really makes it easy for you to extend it as well. So you can write your own modules, they're gonna work in the service, you can call our SDK, you can leverage Azure Resource Manager, all of those capabilities are built you know, into the service and allows you to build on top of that and extend. So if you haven't tried it out, you know, definitely do try out our SDK. For the ISE add-on, I gave a link to GitHub here, um, so you can actually see you know, where the source code lives if you want to use it. I'll see if I can open that up, but why I do? Let me just jump in real quick and show you what the IC looks like, because uh, I think it's uh, useful to see um, what it does. <clears throat> so you can see here, I've actually logged in to the service. I can you know, pick my subscription, if you had multiple ones, and this, if you remember, my ARM account is the one I'm actually pointing to here. So that's my automation account, and it just enumerates all the accounts inside the service. But inside of here now, all those runbooks are available to you. And so you can just you know, op you know, open up one and um, just start to reuse it. Let's see if I can. So this is a very simple one. I was testing some output. But these could be any PowerShell. So you get all the benefits of this. And so you can author inside of here. But then you can also, you know, some key fault stuff. There's almost anything you want to do. You would just normally do in PowerShell, author it here, and you can test it, but then you can upload it to the draft. So you can see this is updated up, uh, locally, so I can just upload it directly into the service. And now it's in the service, but I can test it here, obviously, just running it. But then I can also test it directly up in Azure, because we put it into the service, and so the identical script you authored and tested here, you can push it to the service and just test it directly inside of here. And it'll just off it goes. 
One thing I mentioned is, you know, you can test it either in Azure or if you have a hybrid, you can cut it there as well. All right, so let me uh, jump out here because I know we want to just finish up. So here's kind of the last uh, slide. It's really about just, you know, what were the session objectives. Hopefully, you know, you learned about what we're doing, kind of where we're heading, how you can bring a lot of your PowerShell forward. Uh, but I did want to mention as well that, you know, we have some customer days going on. And maybe you can talk about those. So, um, so we've got customer days where people can, uh, can come in. You know, uh, we actually have two of them scheduled. And um, if you're within the U.S., you know, just send uh, send me or email, you know, an email, uh, and um, we'll we'll see if we can get you into it. If uh, it's for U.S. only, but if you're international and you're willing to pay for your travel, then you know we'll we'll put you up for here that as well. Uh, the last thing is the uh, the OMS blog, so blogs TechNet, you know, MS OMS, and um, that's where a lot of this stuff is, and where a lot of it's going to be going forward. And so thank you, and with that. I've got some stickers, you know, if you guys want to you know, slide by, grab these as we clear out the room for the next people. All right, thanks guys. Push the button. Push the button. Just one.